we did talk and you were a feature Friday years ago. Yes, that so, was super so you, fun. So you've been, <laughs> you've been on our radar forever. Uh, how did you find Chronometer? You know, I'm pretty sure I found it through Jeff Novick. So Jeff Novick is a nutritionist. He has worked with Dr. John McDougal for many years, and he's always analyzing food. You know, I remember he has a very famous article where he's comparing iceberg lettuce to, I think it was romaine lettuce or something like that. Everybody's always saying iceberg lettuce is such a terrible food. And he's like, no, if you look at it based on the nutrition, iceberg lettuce is great. And he would always do his work with chronometer. So that's how I got into it. And obviously when I was diagnosed with type one diabetes, when I was 12, so that was January 26th of 2000. I'll never forget that day. So once I started changing my diet and learning about my nutrition intake, using chronometer was a great solution to figure out how many grams of carbohydrate was I consuming. And then I could figure out the proper amount of insulin to inject in a much more accurate way than the typical, just kind of like counting, you know, with, Oh, this banana is 15 grams of carbs or this apple's 20. It's accurate to use a food scale. I've been using a food scale since 2006 and I get it. I get accurate numbers. I dose accurately. And that helps me with my blood glucose control. So you're managing your type 1 diabetes a lot with your diet then? Absolutely. 100%. Diet, lifestyle, the whole thing. That's so interesting because the prevalence, I've looked at like the statistics and obviously type 1 is more rare than type 2 now because we're just seeing a ton of different people being diagnosed with, with type 2 diabetes. On your program with Mastering Diabetes, what is the ratio that you see between type 1 and, and type 2? You know, I would say it's about 20% living with some form of insulin-dependent diabetes. So that could be type 1, that could be type 1.5, it could be insulin-dependent type 2, and then about 80% are living with some form of non-insulin-dependent diabetes. So that's again, you know, type 2 and pre-diabetes. So about 80-20. How did you find out that you were diagnosed when you were 12? So my older brother was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes nine years prior to me. So I was quite familiar with the condition. I was familiar with the symptoms that he experienced. And I complained to my mom. I said, mom, I'm thirsty all the time. I'm going to the bathroom all the time. I'm pretty sure I have diabetes. She said, no, 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 no. Don't be silly. You don't have diabetes. I was like, okay. So I continued to live my life, continued to be thirsty all the time, going to the bathroom all the time, definitely losing some weight. And my, we were living in Minnesota at the time. My parents flew to Florida because they were looking at houses. We were going to move to Florida. And we did move to Florida. And my mom called and she checked in and she said, hey, how you doing? Like, how's everything going? I said, mom, last night I couldn't sleep. I was cramping all night long. She said, okay, go upstairs, use your brother's blood glucose meter and test yourself. And I tested myself and I was well over 400. And so that's, you know, the American numbers here. And so you really should not, as a healthy, normal person, you really shouldn't be above 140. So my brother said right then and there, you have type 1 diabetes, pack your bag, you're going to be in the hospital for a few nights. So we went to the regular doctor, they ran some tests, and they officially said, yep, you have type 1 diabetes. Then we went to the hospital, and I only had to stay there for one night because my parents are very familiar with the condition. Right. And I remember uh, my dad came back, and he said, well, my, both my parents flew back, and my dad said, you know, this is just an inconvenience. Don't worry. You can do anything you want in life. And that's the way my parents raised us. And the process of living with type one, for, I'm a type A type of person. My parents were familiar with it. My brother was there. It was, it was pretty graceful. I just sort of like took it on. I wouldn't say it really like dramatically impacted my life that much at the time. I kind of just ease into it and realize, you know what, this is life. And looking back, it's kind of been a little bit of a blessing because I don't think I would be as healthy as I am today without mm -hmm. the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. It has really encouraged me to live a completely different, healthy lifestyle. And who knows what I'd be eating, what other conditions would be developing in my body that I know are not happening right now. That's amazing. It's interesting that you and your brother were both diagnosed with type 1 because as we were saying before we started recording, Brian, who is our chief marketing officer, his his goddaughters have a similar similar story. Honestly, I think like the one was diagnosed when she was younger and then like almost a decade later, same as you and your brother, another one is diagnosed. Is it typically something that's hereditary? You know, I, I, I don't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but it does happen. I don't know how frequently it happens. 
That's so interesting. So can you explain, uh, because we're just starting at the beginning and and educate people who know nothing about these at all. What is the difference between type one, which is what you have, and type two? Okay, so the difference is that type one diabetes is classified as an autoimmune condition. So what's happened is the beta cells inside my pancreas are no longer producing insulin, and those beta cells have been damaged. We really don't know why or how. We just don't know the cause of type one. If we did, we could probably do something about it, but we don't. So there's a lot of theories of what causes the beta cells to get damaged and destroyed. We don't know, but we do know there are antibodies present in people living with an autoimmune form of diabetes. So I have antibodies. They are still present. I've tested them. I have a C-peptide, which is less than 0.01. And C-peptide is a surrogate for understanding how much insulin your pancreas is producing. So C-peptide and insulin, they're producing a one-to-one ratio. And then they break off and then C-peptide floats around and it's easy to test. So bottom line, type one diabetes is characterized by not enough insulin production. That's what's happening. I have to inject insulin in order to survive. And insulin was discovered in 1921, first used in humans in 1922. Prior to that, it was pretty much a death sentence if you were living with type one diabetes, you really couldn't survive for much, much longer than a couple months. Now, type two diabetes, this is actually characterized by, in, in the initial process, excess insulin production. There's actually too much insulin being produced because you're living with insulin resistance and your body is trying to compensate for that insulin resistance by producing more and more and more insulin. And eventually, it's a lot of times, you, the pancreas just gets tired and that you actually do end up having a lower level of exogenous internal production or endogenous insulin production because your pancreas just gets exhausted. But initially, it's too much insulin. It's a lifestyle condition, and that's really the difference. So type 1, autoimmune, we don't know what caused it. We don't know how to reverse it. Type 2 is a lifestyle condition. We do know what causes it, and we can reverse it, especially if it's caught early enough. Okay, so we're seeing so much more information about type 2 diabetes. And I definitely want to, you know, get into to more like your personal history and the evolution of how your life has changed um, in the last 20 years. But there, I think there's like a little bit of a stigma with type 2 diabetes. Before I worked at Chronometer, I worked in the public health department in our hospital and alongside a registered dietitian. And she mainly monitored clients who had type 2 diabetes. And oftentimes I would, you know, hear her just like make recommendations for, for changing their lifestyle a little bit, act, you know, being more active, eating differently, tracking their nutrition. What do you think has really caused this, like this uptick in type 2 diabetes? And do you think that we could be making a lot more changes and then people could be uh, avoiding this diagnosis entirely? Yeah. So I want to address the the first part you brought up there about there kind of being like a stigma, right? Like people sort of mm-hmm. like judging off, oh, you have type 2 diabetes and like there's something wrong with you, right? And that is certainly not something that I believe or we believe at Mastering Diabetes. Everybody is always doing the best they can in every situation. And, you know, what leads any, any individual to, you know, eat in a way that leads to excess weight and then eventually causes type 2 diabetes. There's a million factors there and you, we don't know. You know, you, you can't look any human being you can't judge them. You have no idea what led them to where the position they're in now, but just know that they always did the best they could every step of the way. Mm-hmm. And so it's, there's no judgment there. Now, what we can look at, though, are the facts and what's happening as a population and the fact that the numbers are increasing and the levels of obesity and people being overweight. It is increasing. And that is basically at the root of what causes type two diabetes, okay? So it, it's really, it's insulin resistance. And that's what we talk about at Mastering Diabetes. That is what our entire book is about. It's about reversing insulin resistance permanently. And so what's happening is in our society, we have people who are eating more and more processed food. We have people eating, there's more oil in our diet, okay? There's in those processed food, there's a, this unnecessary amount of refined sugar, that's not helping. People aren't moving as much as they should. And you get this combination, which is just an absolute perfect storm for metabolic conditions such as type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease is our nation's number one cause of death. And these are preventable conditions. 
and they are reversible in a majority of cases as well. So it's, it's primarily food. It's our diet that's the biggest problem. Activity is also a problem, but really it's, it's the foods we're eating and we're also eating excess food, particularly because these foods are devoid of nutrients. They're getting mm -hmm. empty calories. Your body keeps on saying, I want more, I want more food, but that's because it's looking for calories or it's looking for nutrients, not more calories. And it just becomes this vicious cycle. And that's one of the things that we really emphasize at Chronometer, obviously, like we're, we're such data nerds. And if you've been with us for this long, you probably have been too, but we just like are really all about not necessarily getting anyone to do one particular diet, but just really wanting people to be cognizant of what they're putting in to their bodies, you know, like knowledge is power. So with this obesity epidemic, it's, it's, we're definitely seeing that it's on the rise. How do you think, like, what is the process? If someone's feeling a certain kind of way, like, what is the process with a type 2 diabetes diagnosis? Like, should people be looking for warning signs and then going and talking to a physician, and then getting tested? Like, walk us through, for anyone listening, if someone's yeah. not feeling well, like what is the process behind yeah. getting getting a, a diagnosis? There are definitely some obvious ones. So if you have any blurry vision, that's mm -hmm. a that's a warning sign. Something's going on with your blood glucose levels. If you're feeling dehydrated beyond maybe what you felt in the past, that's a warning sign that something could be happening with your blood glucose levels. In addition to those, you know, smaller symptoms, there's the bigger ones. Like if you're overweight and you haven't seen your doctor recently and you haven't had an A1C test, you have to get one. If you know your blood pressure is high. That's a warning sign. Okay. That's in, that's insulin resistance as well. And so we, that means you could be on your way to type two diabetes. All right. If you, again, your, your cholesterol is high, you have any of these metabolic you know, biomarkers that are off. It's a warning sign that, Hey, you know what? Diabetes could come along with this, these other conditions you might have been diagnosed with. So I would say a basic metabolic panel is necessary. You should get it on, on a regular basis. You could simply test your fasting blood glucose. All right. So you can get a, uh, just a good old blood glucose meter. You could borrow a friend that might have one, borrow one from a friend. So I would say those basic, basic numbers. But the thing we have to understand here is that type two diabetes starts long before the diagnosis. Okay. Right. So the before type two diabetes is pre-diabetes. So that's an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. That's pre-diabetes. But even if you have an A1C, let's say it's 5.6, 5.5, 5.4, 5.3, let's say you have a good A1C in a healthy range, you might have elevated insulin levels. Okay. So you could get a fasting insulin panel would be a, that get that tested with your doctor. That would be a great early sign of, wait a minute, is my blood glucose hanging in there because I'm producing excess insulin? Because I'm, you're insulin resistant at that point. So insulin resistance begins to develop even before you get to prediabetes. Then once you have prediabetes, it's a prerequisite to have insulin resistance in order to have prediabetes. Then at that point, if you let it progress, then you go to type two. But you have to understand it starts even before prediabetes and there's things you can do to turn that around and again, like just overall health, focusing on basic biometrics, you can start to ensure that you are going to become insulin sensitive. But we also have to have a conversation about being glucose tolerant. So we have a, there's a lot of confusion in the world of nutrition. And I know you, you bring on people on this podcast from a wide range of perspectives. And that's what mm -hmm. I love about you guys and what you do and the platform you've built is you serve everybody in this health and wellness field, and you provide options. I think that's beautiful. So today okay. I have the opportunity to present and represent another perspective that people might not be aware of. And we're just here to say, look, we're, hey, we're, we're an option. If you wanna try us mm -hmm. out, like come join the party. Mm -hmm. We don't say negative things about other people. Like I think anybody doing these, any of these diets you can think of, we have more in common than we don't have common. And those people like we are changing the world together it's the people that are just have, they're apathetic and they're doing nothing. That's, mm -hmm. that's what's going to hurt our country financially. And as far as our quality of life, it's a real, real challenge. So we're all on the same page, but we have to have a conversation around glucose tolerance. So some people could be like, Hey, look, 
my weight is at a good place, my A1C is at a good place, my insulin levels are low because I'm doing low carbohydrate diet, I'm doing a ketogenic diet. So therefore all, all my numbers are looking good. Mm -hmm. And I just want to raise the red flag, like, like have people think twice about choosing to live in a state where you cannot metabolize the glucose in things like bananas or having some rice or having some beans or having some quinoa or having a potato. And you're living in that state where if you eat those foods, all of a sudden you see this large spike and it goes, you're going to 150, 160, 170, you're going to 200 and you're staying there. We have to really, as a community, like think, oh, is that really a smart idea to live in a state where you are glucose intolerant? And I got to say, chronometer has been an amazing tool for me to be able to analyze food and break down the carbohydrate to understand mm -hmm. exactly how much glucose am I consuming? And that's a fascinating topic because most people are like, oh, I, I just, I ate, you know, a hundred grams of carbohydrate for lunch. Well, how much of that was fiber? How mm -hmm. much of that was fructose? How much of that was glucose? And through your software, you can break it down. So you look at the, you take, you know, if I'm looking at any given meal, I could go and say, okay, sucrose, let's say sucrose. I'm actually looking at my, my day today right now. It's, I think I have, uh, I'm in my chronometer. My diary for the day shows, what's my total calories here? I'm getting used to the, the new software, which is beautiful. <laughs> okay, 2,613 is my total calories so far. So if I want to figure out how much glucose that I consume today, I go down to the carbohydrate section. I take sucrose, which says 38 grams, and I divide that by two. So we're going to go 38 divided by two. 38 uh, divided by two. Okay, so that's 19. Then I go to glucose. Okay, that's 159 plus 159. Then I go to starch plus 60. Okay, so 238 grams of glucose. That's what I am consuming today, even though my total carbohydrate for the day is 639. So isn't that fascinating how much mm -hmm. there's fiber in there, there's fructose oh, yeah. in there, and it's, it's fun. But I bring this up because I had this personal experience of – understand of doing a, a plant-based ketogenic diet. All right. And I could go, I could, I could now analyze this retroactively. Okay. I could say, okay, well, when I did that diet, it was a, it was a Gabriel cousin style diet. And I could say, okay, well, there was 70 grams of total carbohydrate because there was plenty of fiber on that program. And, right. but it was about 30 grams of glucose. That's what it came out to be. And so actually, no, it was 10 grams. It was 10 grams of glucose. And I needed it when I was on a very, very low carb diet, I used 10 units of total insulin, which is an incredibly low amount of insulin for somebody who's five feet, 11 inches active. Like it was a very low amount. So 10 grams of glucose, 10 gram units of insulin. That's a one to one ratio insulin to glucose. And it's very important because fructose is metabolized independent of insulin. Mm -hmm. And fiber does not require insulin. So it's important to look at these numbers in a very, very clear way. And it's only this podcast where I could talk about this because most people wouldn't. It just goes over their head. <laughs> I mean, you guys are here for it, okay? So we then, love this. <laughs> so then I transitioned to a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet, okay? And now, so then I, I do the math. Let's see, 300 divided by, okay. So I do the math and on an active day, I will get to roughly about 300, 200, 270 to 300 grams of glucose per day, pure glucose, okay? And now I use a physiologically normal amount of insulin, somewhere between like 27 to 30 units of total insulin per day, okay? And that's what a healthy, normal human pancreas secretes when eating uh, you know, a diet that contains carbohydrate energy. So it's about 30 to 50. That's about the average amount of insulin, again, when somebody's following a carbohydrate-containing diet. So now you look at the, that glucose number. Let's just say it's 300 grams of glucose and then 30 units of total insulin. So now we're talking 10 to 1. So I go from a 1 to 1 ratio yeah. to 10 to 1. That's a 900% change in mm -hmm. insulin sensitivity. And th this is... I started to gain these insights. Again, I've been doing this for over 16 years now. And what I learned in my own body as a person living with type 1 diabetes, 
I learned that I know exactly what to do to make insulin work more efficiently. I experience it every day, every meal. I am reversing it. I have reversed insulin resistance. I am supremely insulin sensitive. And the light bulbs went off in my mind. I said, okay, wait a minute. We know that prediabetes and type 2 diabetes is caused by insulin resistance. If I can help people apply these same principles and they can reverse insulin resistance, they can completely get rid of their diabetes. Mm -hmm. And that's when I became really passionate about this. And I started doing a lot of work. I um, helped launch the brand Forks Over Knives and got to be a part of that. And then we got into creating Mastering Diabetes. And here we are today, you know, Diabetes Awareness Month, having a chance to help people understand how a low-fat plant-based whole food diet can really help you maximize your insulin sensitivity. And that's what it's all about. So I know your question was, was about type 2 diabetes. <laughs> uh, I'm going to bring it back. <laughs> like, like the warning sign, if there's anything with your health, like the point I'm trying to make here is even if you think you don't even have any of the warning signs, like, like if you have any trouble losing weight, if your energy is not that great, like insulin resistance is the central node to a laundry list of conditions. And what, you, what I'm encouraging you to do is use Chronometer, use this software, get into the details about your food and learn what things you can do to become more insulin sensitive. Like everybody listening, whether you have diabetes or not, it benefits you to be insulin sensitive and make sure the insulin that your pancreas is producing is used as gracefully and efficiently as possible. I love that. I have so much to say about everything that you just said. So obviously, if, if type 1 is an autoimmune disorder and then type 2 is largely lifestyle, you're obviously helping a ton of people with, with both. But with type 2, when you're talking about reversing, tell me about the diet that you would prescribe. And like like you said, we are... Chronometer, we're kind of a Swiss Army knife. We have no bias to any particular diet and accept all of them. We just hope that people, whatever whatever decisions they're making, that they're getting their nutrients. I love that you tried a ketogenic diet. It's really cool to make yourself a guinea pig, especially when when you're when you're living with type one diabetes. Because I've made myself a guinea pig just to understand our user base better, you know, like awesome. pe- awesome. people, people were like, I, when I did the keto diet, I'm like, why do people care about carbs so much? Like <laughs> why do these numbers have to be accurate. And then it was, it was super illuminating, but, but I, I do like my goal as a community manager is I just want people to be as, as happy and healthy as they possibly can. And I, I, and I truly, truly want that. So what kind of diet are you talking about for, for these type two diabetics that, that can turn it around for them to Absolutely. become more okay. insulin sensitive. It's one of my favorite things to talk about in the entire world. Okay, so what we're talking about here is a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet. Okay, all three of those components are very important. So low-fat, what we mean when we say that is a maximum of 30 grams of total fat per day. That's total fat or a maximum of 15% of total calories coming from fat. And again, chronometer is the the, the gold standard tool (laughs) to use to figure that out. We're always teaching people to use this software to really understand because most people don't know how much fat they consume. They have no idea what percent of their calories are coming from fat. They have no idea what 30 grams of fat looks like. They have No. no idea that bananas contain fat, that lettuce contains fat, beans, all whole foods contain fat and not just fat, they contain essential fatty acids in small Mm -hmm. quantities. And when you can consume enough calories that adds up. And then if you have a a ground tablespoon of flax seeds or chia seeds, you meet your essential fatty acid requirements for the day right then and there. So low fat, then plant-based. So we're focusing on, you know, plant predominant foods here. That's, that's the, that's our, uh, our suggestion for, if you want to, you know, lower your intake of advanced glycation end products, You want to lower your intake of excess protein. You want to lower your intake of leucine. These are all um, components of the diet that are associated with insulin resistance. So low-fat, plant-based, and whole food, meaning that we recommend foods not be consumed in a refined format. And this is where there's a lot of confusion. Okay, so people say, oh, like carbs are bad. Well, the word carbs, 
could mean a lot of different things. It could mean mm-hmm. cookies and it could mean cake. It could mean crackers or it could mean a whole sweet potato. It could mean a bowl of quinoa. It could mean an apple, a pear. So there's a difference between whole unprocessed carbohydrates and then refined carbohydrates. So we're talking about whole food. And we have put food into three different categories. It's very easy to understand. It's a traffic light system. Green light foods are foods that we recommend you eat in unlimited quantities. You do not have to worry about how much of these foods you're consuming because they are loaded with water and fiber, and it's very difficult to overeat. And they're also naturally low in their fat content. So the first category is fruits. That's going to be papayas, mangoes, pears, peaches, bananas, you name it. Whole fruits are in the green light category. Then we have starches. That would be potatoes, yams, butternut squash, acorn squash. Then we have lentils, peas, beans. Those are, there's a wide variety in that category. That's in the green light category. Then we also have intact whole grains. So intact being the key word, farro, millet, quinoa, brown rice. Those are in the green light category. Then we move into non-starchy vegetables. That would be bell peppers, zucchini, carrots, then leafy greens. So we're talking Swiss chard, arugula, romaine lettuce, butter lettuce, all the greens. Then we have mushrooms and herbs and spices. That's the green light category. And so you eat as much of that as you want. And again, these are very hydrating foods. And when people are transitioning, so we have people come in and do a six week challenge. That's, that's the way most people start with us. And that they have a, we have a specific meal plan. And when you are currently in a state of insulin resistance, there are, I'm sure there are many people listening that be like, you know what? You just told me that I could eat as many bananas as I wanted. And if I go and I have one banana, I prick myself and I see my number is 200, 250. How can you tell me to eat as many of those as I want? And how can you tell me that that food's not actually causing high blood sugar? What do you, how, how can you say that that's actually going to reverse type 1 diabetes? It doesn't make sense to me. And so then that's where we have to go back and we have to have the conversation about understanding why you're not able to metabolize the banana in the first place. And mm-hmm. that is because of the foods you ate prior that put your body in a state of insulin resistance. It's Excess dietary fat is the cause of the primary cause of insulin resistance. So trans fat being the worst offender, saturated fat being the second worst offender. Okay, we have excess of that fat that then gets stored in muscle and liver tissue, and it leads to insulin resistance. So the green light foods, the point I'm making here is that you, the first four categories were very carbohydrate rich. It was fruits, starchy vegetables, beans, intact whole grains, all right? That's the first four categories. When you're transitioning, and I would say even long past the transition, how I eat currently 16 years later, every single meal should contain some greens and some non-starchy vegetables in addition to your carbohydrate-rich whole foods. This combination is gonna help blunt blood glucose spikes, and it's gonna help you, especially in the transition, not see these elevated readings that you want to avoid. It's also important to chew your food and eat at a reasonable pace. That is also gonna help, especially when you're eating yourself out of insulin resistance. And walking is important, okay? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be rigorous CrossFit exercise. Just walking will absolutely transform your blood glucose control. So just know that when I'm talking about the green light foods. Now, the yellow light foods. These are foods that are absolutely healthy. We encourage people to include them in their diet, but these are foods you cannot eat in unlimited quantities if you want to have a truly insulin sensitive body. You can't just sit down and just snack on these. And here's why. They're either very high in fat content, they're refined, or they're high in sodium, okay? So the first foods in the yellow light category are nuts and seeds. Then you have avocado, Then we have a fruit called durian, which is a high fat fruit. Then you have olives. Then we have soy products. So even the most whole intact form of soy, which is edamame, is approximately 35% of calories coming from fat. So it's a little bit of a higher fat food compared to, you know, the other green light ingredients. And so 
These are great. These foods are absolutely fantastic. Just have them in smaller quantities. Be cognizant of how much you're consuming so you don't exceed that 15% or 30 gram markers that we talked about earlier. Then things like Ezekiel bread, okay? Like some of these sprouted breads. Or I've, There's like uh, many breads, like millet bread. It's really clean, beautiful, not a bunch of additives. It's very clean, but it's still processed. And the mm -hmm. calorie density is a little bit higher. So we want people, again, people come to us with type 2 diabetes, you know, metabolic issues. They are in a position where they're trying to eat themselves out of a very serious state. Like, Elisa, you're, you, bread wouldn't be such a worry for you. You know what I mean? Like, you're not yeah. trying, you know, like, you have to understand who you are, where you're coming mm -hmm. from, what you're trying to heal. When you're trying to heal type 2 diabetes and, and lose weight, this is something to pay attention to. It's better to have the whole millet than the millet bread. We got to pay attention to this. Okay. Then we move into um, some things like you, you have like these pastas these days. There's bean pastas, there's brown rice pasta. These are great. Again, it's still better to have the original black beans than the black bean pasta. It's just that's unrefined. It's just more nutritious, more nutrient dense. Although with the pastas, when you cook them, the water is absorbed. So the calorie density ends up being, you know, pretty much even, but the nutrient density is not the same. The last thing in the yellow light category would be fermented food. So much research on this topic. Uh, great, great food to be included. It's just very high in sodium. So it's not a food. The distinction is you don't just have a bunch of fermented food. You want to have the appropriate amount. You got to pay attention to it. So that's the, the yellow light category. Now, the red light category, these are foods we recommend that people just completely avoid or minimize. And that's going to be all animal products we're putting in this category. So that's going to be red meat. That's going to be chicken. That's going to be fish. Um, that's going to be seafood. These foods, again, most of them are either higher in fat. Um, there's a little bit of concern about the toxicity with fish these days. Um, there's concerns with the advanced Caucasian end products, the, the leucine. Uh, we talked IGF-1. We talked about this stuff earlier. It's better to minimize or avoid. Then we have oils in this category. I know this is a controversial one, okay? Everybody's fighting about oil. Here's our position on oil. It's from our perspective, again, you're trying to maximize your insulin sensitivity. You're trying to lose weight as a person living with type 2 diabetes. It is better to consume the whole food that the oil was made of. It's great to just have some olives in your diet. Okay, the nutrient density of whole olives is higher than olive oil, okay? Yes. Olive oil happens to be the most calorie-dense food, all oils, okay? The most calorie-dense foods on the planet, okay? Coming mm -hmm. in at about 4,000 calories per pound. For a population that is looking to lose weight, you don't need those extra, those extra calories. You just don't. So focus on whole foods. I can just say from our experience with thousands of clients, even a small amount of oil has a pretty negative impact and it's just not necessary. So that's how we put it in the red light category. Then we have, you know, just the basics like processed stuff, Twinkies. You don't need to have Twinkies if you're trying to reverse type two diabetes. There's a lot of new plant-based foods that are coming in packages, plant-based burgers, lots of ingredients, high in fat. We're not recommending these foods. We put them in the red light category. You know, there's plant-based cheeses. Mm -hmm. These are not foods that are ideal for reversing insulin resistance, for reversing a chronic disease. Let's stick to the whole foods. Let's stick to what nature provides us. Focus on majority of green light, a little bit of yellow light foods, and you're going to be just fine. And what's fun is to how fast this works. Like if somebody just, just gives it a try, like, of course, that first banana, yeah, you're probably going to see a spike on the first banana. But that is a symptom. The high blood glucose reading is a symptom. The disease is insulin resistance. As you're eating more bananas and you're lowering your fat intake, you are addressing the root cause and your blood glucose eventually will begin to come down in a matter of days to weeks when your diet is truly low in overall fat. I love that. So someone like just actioning this, uh, because I think it's really important for people to come up with, with good steps. So they determine that, that they're becoming insulin resistant or pre-diabetic, and then they jump on your diet and they can basically just mitigate type two diabetes, like entirely going down that road. Can somebody follow 
exactly what I'm saying here mm-hmm. and, tr- and like truly reverse type two diabetes, like have it go away. Is that what you're asking? Basically. Yes. Okay. So we have so many testimonials on our website and I'm going to tell you one that comes to mind just to paint an example. And mm-hmm. then we can use those principles and apply it across the board. So there's a woman that comes to us. Her name is Tammy. All right. She lived in Southern California. I lived in Santa Monica at the time. So I had the opportunity to meet with her at the farmer's market. And when she had originally joined our program, she was just kicking and screaming and just like, just wasn't really listening. She wasn't really doing it. Okay. So I meet her at the market. She sees me buying, I have a, a, a produce cart, right? So I'm buying lots of fruit, lots of greens. She sees me putting a bunch of oranges in my cart and she's like, are you you're really going to eat all those oranges? And I'm like, yes, Tammy. Yes. I'm going <laughs> to eat all the oranges. And so can you. And so eventually she finally starts to click and she starts to do it. She listens to us. And she came to us with an A1C of 7.1%. All right. She's using 2000 milligrams of metformin, which is the maximum dose of metformin before you have to start adding in other medications as well. All right. She had her fasting insulin tested at 17.4, which is very high. It should not be above eight. All right. She had fatty liver disease. She had debilitating pain in her knees. She couldn't barely walk without pain. She starts following our program, right? In seven months of eating the green light foods, a little bit of yellow light foods, and avoiding the red light foods, her A1C drops to 5.3%, which puts her in the non-diabetic range. She has stopped taking metformin. So she's, so remember, the 7.1 A1C, that's a medicated A1C. That's on the metformin. If she wasn't on the metformin, right. that A1C would have actually been higher. So yeah. now we're talking about a 5.3% A1C unmedicated. She lost 38 pounds in the seven months. Mm-hmm. And her fasting insulin dropped to 5.2. A beautiful place, right where we want it. Her fasting blood glucose drops to 93. She reverses fatty liver disease. Their pain is gone. And so this is a perfect example of somebody demonstrating how their insulin sensitivity has improved by eating more whole carbohydrate-rich foods. Her carbohydrate intake went up, her Mm -hmm. weight went down, and the amount of insulin that her pancreas had to produce also went down because she was more insulin sensitive. A smaller amount of insulin was processing a larger amount of glucose. That's what's happening for her. And so this is what happens in the process of reversing type two diabetes. So Tammy was the typical case, typical case of hyperinsulinemia and hyperglycemia, high insulin, high blood glucose, that's type two diabetes. And so when we're talking about reversal, we're talking about getting all those metrics back to where they need to be. The A1C in the non-diabetic range, the insulin levels in the appropriate range below eight. Okay. And not using diabetes medications Mm -hmm. and then maintaining that for at least a year. Then you have fully reversed type two diabetes. If you went to a brand new doctor and they did some blood work on you, there would be no diabetes on your record. Like you're you're done. So that's what we're talking about. And that's what happens. Again, the only time this does not happen is if somebody comes to us having type two diabetes for so long that their pancreas is exhausted and they're not producing enough insulin. Their fasting insulin would, would be like, I don't know, maybe a one or a two or something, some, some very small number, meaning that, look, your pancreas is exhausted. That would put you in the category of being insulin dependent type two. And that's okay. You might need to continue using medications. That's not a problem, but you're right. going to still want to become insulin sensitive and, and make sure the meds you're using are beneficial or are you know working efficiently so you can prevent the other conditions that come with diabetes. We have to understand, so it's World Diabetes Awareness Month. The number one cause of death for people living with diabetes is heart disease. It's not Mm -hmm. high blood glucose readings. So we have to be addressing your your overall body. And that's why we're so passionate about raising this topic and being a voice for understanding the importance of glucose tolerance, okay? Just because you have found a way to keep your A1C low and your insulin levels low by not eating carbohydrates, you have to ask yourself, is it smart for me to live in a glucose intolerant state to permanently eat in a way where I can't actually go and have a banana without seeing a spike? 
Because in that case, that person is typically, that, that person is technically could be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes because they would fail an oral glucose tolerance test, which is one right. of the criteria by the American Diabetes Association. And I know the low carb world says, well, why would I want to do that? I don't want to go have 75 grams of glucose if I'm on a low carb diet. I don't need the carbs. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I'll carb adapt. If I go start eating more carbs, then I can pass the OGTT. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right, because you're becoming more insulin sensitive by eating more carbs. <laughs> anyway, it's a fun story. I, I love that you're making an impact. And I know that we are pressed for time, but where can everyone find you? to get more information. Tell us Absolutely. all your channels. I'm so glad you asked. So you can find us on pretty much all the channels. Uh, our, our website's the best place to go. If you go to masteringdiabetes.org mm -hmm. slash quiz two, the quiz and the number two, you can take an insulin resistance quiz and you can find out how insulin resistant you are. So that's a fun place to start. You can get our book everywhere books are sold. Amazon, we read our own audio book on Audible, which was super fun. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can get it at the library. We have a podcast. Just type in Mastering Diabetes into any podcast platform. You'll find us. We are on Instagram. We're on TikTok. We're on YouTube. Just type in Mastering Diabetes. You'll find us. And um, we're having a lot of fun. So any questions you have, like DM us. We, were, we reply to all the DMs. We reply to comments. Like we want to help. We want to contribute. I want to say thank you, Elisa. Like what you guys are doing is amazing. I wish we had more time. Hopefully we should come back. Cyrus and I should come back together and do another show. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Part two. Um, yeah, we'll make time sure. and we'll do that. Yeah, maybe we can make it happen on Monday. We'll see. I just want to say thank you. And um, I use your software every single day, like literally no joke every day. It's the new software is gorgeous. Like I just love thank it. Thank you, so Robbie. Just, <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate having you on and it's always been nice to see you in our feed and uh, we will touch base soon. Thank you. See ya. Have a good Friday. Bye. Right, bye. See ya.